This week on Crossfeed. The military discriminating against atheists. Hot belly Jesus. Cremation and Israel. Our anti-war sermons crossing church and state lines. And rabbis warred against those Christians. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Crossfeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Hey, I'm Dr. Jim Butler. I serve as pastor of St. Luke's Evangelical Lutheran Church in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts, where we've been experiencing record high temperatures this week. And so here it is, first week of fall, and it's been 95 up here. Ooh. <laughs> I've been wearing a jacket to work. Yeah, we, we went swimming yesterday in our pool. So, but the it's yeah, raining I, outside now. So it's supposed to start cooling off again, back to the seventies. So it's been, oh, it's been mis- I actually gave in the front and turned my air conditioning back on today. So, so I'm sitting here dying in my office. <laughs> but other than that, it's been a good week. So has it been good out there in Iowa? Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> you, you ask me all the tough questions because I'm trying to think what I've been doing for the past few days. And I can't even remember. <laughs> uh, it's all a blur. Well, hey, you know, what can I tell you? Yeah, we, we've got to start tonight. Well, first off, I need to do an update for everybody. Last week, remember, um, we had the article about the guy who sued God. Uh, the, the senator from Nebraska, state senator. A um, couple things I found out. Number one is Dale was right. He was doing it to prove how frivolous lawsuits could be. So I have to give Dale because I wasn't sure because the article was, wasn't clear. Uh, second of all, um, the guy who filed the lawsuit, by the way, happens to be agnostic. So I guess he was wanting to see if God would answer. And three, God did answer. There were uh, two answers that I, I was reading this week that they came from that, and um, one of them was his, his, God was represented by Michael the Archangel, and uh, said, you know, um, I deny all these claims, and I'll talk to you real soon. So, um, <laughs> yes, uh, just an update. Now, of course, I think everybody, I think everybody listening should know uh, I have a son who serves in the military. He uh, is uh, currently stationed at um, Fort Carson, Colorado. He's a tanker. And do a shout-out now to Josh, because he actually listens to us. And just talk to him. And he said... Uh, he yeah, listen oh. or watch? He listens. He listens. Oh, okay. Then so, he didn't see me wave. No. Uh, Hi, Josh. So uh, well, we'll, we'll, both, we'll both acknowledge my son here. but um, Give us a call, Josh. We'll put you on the show. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> But it brings up then the, the situation, uh, and, and Josh goes to uh, chapel out there fairly often in the military, and he's enjoyed doing that. Uh, he's heard uh, from a couple of very good Lutheran um, chaplains. But now we've got a situation out in Topeka at Fort Riley, Kansas, where my son might have gone. It was yeah, they could have sent him there instead of Colorado. And there was a um, <clears throat> an atheist soldier out there at Fort Riley, and he came, uh, complained that uh, this officer, Major Freddie J. Wellborn, uh, um, who has, may or may not exist. Well, no, no, Freddie does. Originally, he oh, said okay. Paul Wellborn, and they couldn't find a Paul Wellborn, so he said, oh, "I okay. must have the wrong name. It's Freddie, Freddie J." And uh, said that this guy gave him a hard time for trying to organize a chapter of uh, the Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers um, uh, at his base in Iraq. Uh, he says the guy threatened to file military charges against him and block his reenlistment uh, for holding a meeting of atheists and non-Christians. Um, the specialist Jeremy Hall is the guy's name, and he is an MP which my son was start out as, actually. 
I have a hard time believing this. Yeah. Number one, we are stretched very thin in Afghanistan and Iraq. And if you had some major against a guy who had no other disciplinary problems trying to block his reenlistment, there'd be a general on his back real quick saying, what are you doing? Um, and I have a real hard time seeing uh, uh, a major trying to push his religion on an enlisted man. I mean, there's just too many protections in the military for that kind of stuff to happen. Inconceivable! Okay. Now, this uh, this major is uh, working toward a degree from a Bible college, according to his MySpace mm -hmm. page. And... Um, but, yeah, as far as... I would assume that if you're going to try to block someone's reenlistment, there's some sort of channels that you would use that this could be verified one way or the other. Oh, I'm sure there are some some way. I mean, normally they they're just really desperate to, you know, keep you in. I mean, come on, we're we're, we're talking about a, a a group that pays you twenty thousand bucks to sign back up. Okay, I mean, this is like somebody. You know, this is this is like Ford giving out the rebates, you know, and some Ford guy saying, don't sign, don't buy this car. You know, I mean, it doesn't work that way. Unless you are a washout. War is not like one great. <laughs> you know, and I, I thought it was interesting. I mean, because this one guy says, uh, you know, um, his lawyer says it's important to, you know, that this, this guy is a... Um, officer doesn't have the right to force his religion on other people. And, you know, absolutely can't do that. No, of course not. Um, there's... Stuff. What gets me, though, is it says it's against this major and Defense Secretary Robert Gates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it must I mean, be really important um, for, uh, for the Defense Secretary to be involved in this. I mean, considering, um... Concentrate, Pinky, concentrate. Um, you know, Gates only got on the job, what, in January? I mean, this guy was probably in Iraq trying to get his meetings together when, uh, um... He, uh, when, when, when Gates was, you know, nominated. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea why in the world he's, he's, uh, uh... Yeah, you know, getting after you know naming him. Uh, you always have to name one one person. <laughs> I guess. I would think that it would be, if anything, it would be this major and his CO, or something like that. Right, or who are the immediate CO of the of 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 the, this the specialist. Uh, the other thing, looking at it. I mean, it, they filed it in federal court. I think there's actually a, a military court you could go through. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, you know, you know, so and that's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say he he uh, followed proper channels. I mean, if nothing else, you go to complain to the chaplain. Yeah. I mean, I I was talking to a Navy chaplain, and you know, he he told me about going down through and meeting all the guys, and you know, you know well, I'm no religious preference chaplain. That's okay. I'm the no religious preference chaplain. I'm here for you. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. Now, what can I do to serve you? What can I do to, you know, but I'm sure there's got to be, you know, had to be something through the military to do that. I would think so. But again... Well, it'll be interesting to see if anything comes of this. The thing that I noticed out of this is this that there is a military association of atheists and free thinkers. Right. Right. So what does this tell you? In case you're ever wondering, yes, atheism is an organized religion. So, you know, people go, oh, well, it's not like atheists are getting together, you know, every Sunday and, you know, worshiping reason or something like that. Well, um, yeah, they are. There's all kinds of atheist uh, organizations out there. Right. So, well, I, I wouldn't go so far as say they're an organized religion because they're not really worshiping anything. Uh, they more, more hold discussion groups and talk about why they're so much better not believing in anything than those idiots out there who do believe in something. Mm -hmm. But, uh, 
Of course, the, well, the one thing that, that, that it does say, too, is that uh, the guy didn't respond to phone calls and things, the, 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 the defendant in this case, Major Wilburn. So I'd like to know his side of the story. Yeah. You know, uh, because there's got to be, I would, there's always two sides. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm wondering if, you know, it's indicative. Again, I don't know. This is just a guess if maybe the fact that this guy may not be following channels now may be indicative of the reason the guy didn't want him in the military, think he'd be good to have back the military. He doesn't know how to follow channels correctly. Yeah. And believe yeah, me, I mean, that's a big thing what, in the Army. Yeah, what kind of trouble was he causing before? Yeah. You know. It'll be interesting to see what happens with mm-hmm. this, whether anything happens at all with it, or if it ends up just getting thrown out. So, it would be interesting one way or the other to see what does happen with it. This is madness. Speaking of the military, let's go to Pasadena. Now, this is kind of a follow-up because we did uh, talk about the story a year ago uh, when this began to co- uh, come down the pike. Um, and out there, there is All Saints Episcopal Church, which has a history of being a very liberal, politically active congregation. And just a few days before the 2004 presidential election, uh, their pastor, J. Edwin Bacon, Jr., uh, said... Um, no, actually, it was... Oh, uh, oh, the former, former rector. Pastor. Yeah, okay, George Regas, you're right, the former pastor, George Regas, um, you know, um, had a sermon in which he was critical of the Iraq War and the Bush tax cuts. And so the IRS investigated to check it out. Although, the, although they said, uh, well, you're still tax exempt, uh, but this was an intervention in the presidential race. Yeah. In other words, all right, this is your first offense. We'll, uh, we'll let it go this time. Yeah. Well, you're guilty, but we're not going to, pre- we're not going to press it. So to which, uh, uh, Reverend Bacon, the, the current pastor, said that the letter's unclear conclusion could mean future investigation of the church and leaves a chilling effect on the freedom of clerics from all faiths to preach about moral values such as war and poverty. All right. Well, I'll tell you one thing. The Bush tax cuts, I keep hearing people complaining about the tax cuts for the rich. The Bush tax cuts gave our family a huge tax cut, and we're not rich. So never really understood that argument. I don't know. Maybe it gave bigger tax cuts to the um, people who are richer than us, but that's because you're a right-wing Republican. That's why you, you know you're just in it for yourself. But <laughs> no. Oh yeah, yeah. That's right. It's that that little box when you use uh, TurboTax and it says, "Are you a Republican?" and you click it, and then all of a sudden your your own tax cuts in half. <laughs> right. Well, what helps you out is that really it's a child tax credit. With three children, you that that eliminates your tax burden completely. I know because I lost You'd all. Think. I lost all that now. My kids are seventeen. Why? Why it is that you don't have to be eighteen to lose that? I haven't figured out. But you lose it when they're the year they the year they turn seventeen. And so uh, you know what I'll bet that is. See what you do is you don't claim them that um that final year because when you apply for financial aid, if your parents claimed you the previous year, then um that counts against you for college financial aid. And but so what it is, it's, it's to discourage parents from claim. That's my guess. Anyway. No, no, no. You can from, still claim them as an exemption, but you don't think the tax credits, two different things. But oh, okay. that's getting us off the subject here. Um, yeah. Now, you, you can preach against poverty. Um, but or I don't know if poverty... Hurting um, people in poverty. But I don't know if if preaching against poverty means uh, I think this pol you know it, it, it it's one thing to preach against poverty it's another thing to say this particular policy decision was wrong right you know I mean to me if I'm going to preach against poverty in Pasadena California you know suburb of Los Angeles very wealthy I look at my own congregation and I start complaining to them. What are you doing for the poor? Right. Yeah. I mean, you you know, you got all these McMansions sitting around. Um, 
Now, what is your personal giving like? I mean, that's that's what you you, you know. That's how you deal, I think, with the poor. Um, same thing, you know. You preach against war. Don't lecture me about war. That's and, a really touchy thing, especially with this war, because. If you are, in order to preach against war, unless you're a complete pacifist, which you really have a hard time using the Bible um, to promote absolute pacifism, then what you have to do is you have to make assumptions about um, about the motivations behind the war. Right? As soon as you do that, then you are breaking the commandment to uh, not bear false witness. So, um, and possibly when you're talking about uh, leaders of government, you're also breaking the commandment to honor uh, honor your father and mother, which we would, we understand to include all those in authority over you. If, if you're just sort of making these statements about what you assume were their um, their motivations for starting a war. Uh, you're on really shaky ground there. You know, you could say, if their motivation was this, you know, then you could arguably say that it was wrong. Sure. Um, but you're making, but like, well, I, I, and uh, it, it's hard for me when I have a son who's, I was getting my car uh, wheels aligned today on my truck, and this guy picked me up and was driving me, and he was just like, we can spend all this money on Iraq. We can get universal health care, and, and we can, you know, we shouldn't even be over there. This is just really stupid. And I, I, and, I, and I just kept my mouth shut because I really wanted to look at him and say, come Christmas, my son will be there. You know, the, uh, the orders have come down. My son will not be dreaming of a white Christmas. Well, actually, he will be. <laughs> That's right, with all the sand around him. Um, so, you know, I, I guess it's, I, and, and I had somebody ask me, they said, well, you know, aren't you worried? Of course I'm worried. You know, I, you know I'm yeah. very nervous about him going over. Uh, but I also know, hey, don't sign up if you're not planning on going, because that's that's the reality right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I guess as a, a, a father of a soldier, I really, you know, I have a problem with this guy standing up and, and com you know, preaching to a bunch of people who probably aren't, don't have their kids in the military. He has gone unchallenged long enough. So, well, you know, I really kind of struggle with this. I struggle with ch churches that want to be, quote, prophetic voices, unquote. Because the prophets weren't speaking to a secular government. They were speaking to a theocracy that was God's people, God's covenant people. And they had a message, thus says the Lord, this is what God says. Now, I don't know if God said this particular war is unjust, but other wars were just. Oh, very nice, Ben. Great. Uh, so, I mean, you know, there's the whole question also of... Uh, the question of the IRS and nonprofit status and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's that's kind of something else entirely. I mean, we as Lutherans, according to our theology, say that the, the church should keep those out of the government and um, not be preaching about government policy. Uh, so, and we we've talked about that in previous episodes about the two kingdom yeah. theology. Yeah. So, but there's when, especially the fact that this was during a uh, presidential race, you know, that makes it particularly suspect. Mm -hmm. Of course, here in Iowa, the presidential race begins um, three days after the um, previous election, <laughs> pretty much. But, but but it ends in January. You know, once the caucuses are held, you know, that's it for, you know, until after the election. Oh, right, yeah, everybody starts heading to Iowa real quick. Also, who knows how if that's going to continue or not. But Oh, oh, oh yeah, well, because our governor wants to push our date even earlier. All right. <laughs> Sorry for getting off the subject. Uh, yeah, I know, but that's, yeah, that is... One thing I, I appreciate 
though. I, I think it's interesting, though, this church has a long history of being very socially, a very social activism uh, back to World War II when its rector spoke against the internment of Japanese Americans. Uh, I thought that was interesting, that, that he, was, he was out there, you know, getting upset about that, which, in that case, I'm probably on his side. Yeah. But again, what is the church's role over and against the state? And at what point do we say the state now is wrong? As we are Lutherans, we are very cautious about that. Um, yeah, both, there's a few, you know, subjects where where we will definitely speak. Um, homosexuality is a hot topic that you will hear uh, Lutherans speak on. Uh, abortion or any kind of um, a situation where human life is not being respected. You know, you'll hear us speak on those things because the Bible specifically speaks on those things. Um, the Bible's pretty clear on those things. And but yeah, when it comes down to something like war and, and sort of what makes for just war and, and things like that, you know, the Bible speaks to that. But the problem is that the issues involved um, are not always so cut and dry. And and there is the question. I mean, what is uh, and you can you can go on just war theory forever. What what constitutes a just war? I mean, there's a lot of questions right. of that. And you can, I think, legitimately ask. You know, and I would in a small group or something if you want to. You know, does a particular war, uh, the first Iraq war, this I this war, uh, Vietnam, uh, you know, World War Two, do they, um you know, meet the criteria for what constitutes a just war. Right. You know, and there's there's some I think some legitimate questions uh about about that. Uh, I think it's legitimately asked, should we gotten involved in Iraq in the first place? Um sure. you know, and um personal opinion is no, I think we made a mistake. But I think it would be a bigger mistake to pull out now. But yeah, you can make all these discussions going on, um, but my wisdom as a pastor is no greater than anybody else's wisdom in these issues. I mean, I'm a guy who reads it through, um, you know, like Bill Rogers, all I know is what I read in the papers. You know, and that's why, you know, we got to pray for our government, the people whose responsibility it is to make those decisions. Right. You know, the other thing to keep in mind when you're talking about this stuff is there's all this information that does not appear in the papers, you right. know, that we don't know, that's classified information. And, you know, and people can go on and on about how, you know, well, based on everything that we've seen, you know, we, we shouldn't have gone in there or whatever, but you know what? Um, somebody saw some information somewhere that convinced mm -hmm. them that you know, that we should go in there because it wasn't just our president, it was uh, Tony Blair, and, and there were a number of other national leaders that were in favor of doing it. So, obviously, there was some information somewhere that, at least at that time, made them figure that, you know, that this was something that needed to be done. So, but, you know, like Jim said, there's sort of water under the bridge now, and now we have to deal with where we're at. You know, Magneto's right. There's a war coming. You sure you're on the right side? But would have made a difference if they had a pot belly Jesus. <laughs> Okay, folks, now that you've seen the ad, is that not the tackiest thing you've ever seen in your life? I, I think that you really have to try to do worse. Now, if they're trying to, to get the word out about their, um, their TV channel, uh, they're, they're doing the job because, hey, they got us talking about it. 
Yeah. You know? And so if you want to argue that there's no such thing as bad press, well, they're going to get plenty of that. Uh, the Catholic Church, this is in Belgium, so, which is why the, um, which is why it was in Spanish, or uh, French, I mean. But, uh, I think it was French, I didn't recognize. Anyway, the, it, the Catholic Church is, is protesting it, and they're saying that it uh, crosses the limits of respectability. I would tend to agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Plucky V says, it's not blasphemous, but contains a message about a laid-back Jesus addressing you. He's not addressing you. Heck there's no. There's nothing in there that should be addressing you. Heard that thing. <laughs> Undressing youth, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, turns it to got uh, two, two, two girls and, you know, bikini-wearing babes there. Um, and, With double horns. Yeah, and it makes the little, you know, I, I mean, and, and talk about the blasphemous and, you know, using the the, the sign of the cross as a, a magic thing, you know, talk about the second commandment, not using God's name in vain, and Luther talks about, you know, using God's name superstitiously. You know, that was the part of the video. But we should probably summarize this for those who are just listening to the audio who haven't seen it. And by the way, if you go to crossfeednews.com, you find the story uh, about a pot belly Jesus, and you uh, yeah, and then you click on the ad in question. That'll take you to the YouTube clip. But okay, here it is. Here's the, the description from the BBC. The ad shows a long-haired hippie Jesus grooving along. A long-haired hippie overweight Jesus, by the way. Grooving along as he tries to get into nightclubs, refuses entry by the bouncers. Jesus makes the sign of the cross and sweeps aside the bouncers, shrinking them so they are left in his wake as dwarves. Um, this plug TV version of Jesus then drinks whiskey at the bar and magically turns two brown haired, frumpy women into blonde babes wearing bikini tops and red horns. The Jesus Please character the then disappears again. into a huge limousine with the women but his attention is distracted by an advertisement for Plug TV before he's recalled by God, who is standing on a cloud wearing a t-shirt with Number One Dad written on it. The God figure then tells Jesus off for wanting to watch Plug TV as well as everything else, saying, You still want more. Oh, good grief. I don't even understand that last part, even in English. You got the whiskey, you got the babes, and you still want more? Okay. Well, you have a TV show too. So I, it's. I don't. Know, I think there's one of those things where they're just deliberately being um, blasphemous, just to raise eyebrows and give them publicity. So congratulations, Plug TV. We're giving you publicity. They're um, being blasphemous and raising eyebrows to get publicity because they can. You notice this mm. was not Muhammad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh. You know, I mean... If if anybody thinks that this wouldn't have caused a riot if it were Muhammad instead of Jesus, then you can email us at <laughs> crossfeednews.com or call our voicemail at 206-350-4749. Some tells me we're not going to get any feedback on that one. <laughs> so, oh, I mean, we'd love to hear from you either way. But yeah, I mean, this is this is such a blat one well, again one of these blatant double standards. They would never do this with with with, with for Muslims. It would be considered. So I can't imagine them doing this with. I mean, with with Buddha, with. Um, you know, uh, Krishna with, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, even like the, the Mormon president or prophet or whatever you call him. Or, I mean, I can't imagine any other group being, I can't imagine them, them doing this and getting away with it. Right. Not even Alvin and the Chipmunks, man. They wouldn't even do it with them. No. And then they get sued for copyright. So, I mean, it, it, it just is. Um, how they get sit there and say, oh, this isn't blasphemous. Well, you don't see anything wrong with it. You know, Paul and Timothy, 
talks about, you know, those whose consciences have been seared is with a hot iron. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. You know, it's, there it is. Uh, in Romans, he talks about, you know, uh, they will be haters of God, haters of authority, haters of parents. They will invent ways of doing evil. Yeah. You know? This is a pretty creative way to do evil. And that's very... Uh, that's, yeah. And then it's like, oh, Lord, just lay back Jesus reaching out to you. So give me a break. That's, that's horrible. Yeah. And, you know, but really the thing that bothered me the most was the use of the cross. Even more than their, their blasphemous depiction of Jesus, it was the use of the cross as a sort of magic wand-waving kind of thing. Um, because, you know, when, when Christians make the sign of the cross, right, it's not some sort of magic... Expecto Patrona! ...spell or something like that. The point of that is to be, remind yourself or others of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Right. You know, and really it's it, it's the exact opposite of what this video depicts. You know, the reality is that Jesus gave up all that. He gave up everything. He set everything aside for us. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he even died for the people that made that video. I did not know that. So, I mean, you know, this video is just a big slap in the face to the one who, you know, who they were given the freedom to, uh, um, you know, okay, well, set you free from your sin, and this is how you respond. Of course, whenever we sin, it's, it's the same thing. Whether you're making, you know, blasphemous videos or, or whatever, it's, it's the same deal. You're, you're responding to God's love, to God giving you everything, even eternal life, by um, by turning against Him. But that's the amazing love. That's the power in the sign of the cross, or more specifically, the power in the one who died on the cross. So this is just sad. Yeah, it is. Our final two stories this week both take place in Israel. And where do you want to start? Call me Israel. Oh, since we're talking about Jesus and Christians, let's do the Israeli rabbis. Okay. There's a uh, Jewish holiday of Sukkot. I'm not sure how to pronounce yep, it. Yes, Sukkot, sure. the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeah. It's mentioned in the uh, Book of Ruth. I think. And, uh. It's in numbers. And Leviticus. Is it? Okay. Maybe, oh, I'm, wait, I'm thinking of a different one. Oh, anyway. I, I have a hard time keeping this. I know Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement, and, uh, Rosh Hashanah is the, um, the, uh, Jewish New Year. Right. Rosh Hashanah. Don't get technical with me. Not Rosh Hashanah. Okay. It's Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Obviously, you know, yeah, obviously you don't live the Jewish port area of uh, Iowa there. <laughs> True. I mean, our town, my well, town, we, my town is so Jewish that uh, the kids, the public schools, get off for Yom Kippur. Yeah, but in Hebrew, in Rosh Hashanah, is it is it different in modern Hebrew than in um, biblical Hebrew? I don't know. I just know how all the Jews in town pronounce it. <laughs> and uh, so I can tell you that much. The uh, oh, By the way, Rosh Hashanah is... See, I always wondered because the Bible says that Exodus, the Exodus is supposed to be the beginning of their year, be the first month of the year. That's the first month of the liturgical year. But oh, okay. Rosh Hashanah is the first month of the civil year. Okay. So there's, there's a difference there. I, I, I see. What you learn from talking to the local rabbi? Okay, well, does he have anything to say about uh, the uh, International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem? I doubt it. Although he, he wished me a Merry Christmas last year. <laughs> he, he was a Reform rabbi, so. Uh, okay, well, that's not what we're really talking about here. All right. uh, so according to the Old, the Old Testament book of Zechariah, 
All nations will make pilgrimages to Jerusalem in the Messianic era to celebrate Sukkoth. Uh, Christians have interpreted this to mean that Sukkoth is a holiday where Jews welcome non-Jews to join them in celebration in Jerusalem. Well, at least this International Christian Embassy of Jerusalem has interpreted it that way. I would, you yeah, know, I've never interpreted it that way. Yeah, I've never interpreted it that way either. Um, I got a bad feeling about this. But anyway, so uh, the, 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 these evangelical groups um, go over to take part in the, this big celebration, as do the Israeli lawmakers and government representatives and ordinarily Israelis. Um, um, this has been going on for 28 years, this, this, this Christian celebration of this Jewish holiday. Uh, right. But now these rabbis have said, eh, stay away. They just want you to become Christian. Um, yeah. Yeah, They're that's, going that's to proselytize you, which actually this organization does not uh, proselytize. Right. Um, because uh, it they would. Its supporters do not accept teachings accepted by some other Christian groups that masses of Jews will die in the final battle between God and Satan if they do not accept Jesus. So apparently these guys subscribe to the um, the two we call it the, the two covenants theory. Yep. The Jews are saved by the blood of Abraham and Christians are saved by the blood of Christ. Even though Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father but by me. Right. Although I mean that's uh well it, it's again it's that belief that uh, God's not quite finished with the Jewish people. I don't want to go down that road again as we talk about dispensationalism and things. But um, yeah. what I what I found most interesting about it was, uh, you know, how many people over there are going, are you people crazy for getting upset about this? Do you realize these evangelicals are some of our best allies? You know, they're, they're our strongest supporters. What, why are you going out and upset, upsetting these people for? They bring uh, $18 million into the local economy. That's right. I mean, okay. If a if a Christian group wants to celebrate a Jewish holiday, go ahead. I mean, you've got that freedom. Um, sure. If you want to join a bunch of Jewish people in celebrating a Jewish holiday, go right ahead. Like I said before, I've got kids in my confirmation class who, you know, some of the creators, man, come spring they'll be in bar mitzvahs every every weekend. You know, a party at one party after another. Um, Go ahead, you've got that freedom. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, so, but would you, would you, if the, uh, um, if the local uh, uh, Mormon church was having a some kind of uh, festival of some kind, would you encourage them to go to that? Hey, bud, let's <laughs> party. They would go. There's no coffee. Anyway, uh... <laughs> Sorry about this. I know it's a bit silly. I, I mean, what kind of festival? I don't know what kind of, you know, festivals or celebrations a, um, you know, Mormon family might have. I mean, if they... I, I mean, if you're having a, a wedding at the local Mormon steakhouse, uh, you know, and this guy's your friend, he invites you to the wedding, well, yeah, go to the wedding. Yeah. So that's, I mean, it sounds like this thing is basically just, uh a big, uh, kind of a big party, you know, it, there's really, and I guess I don't know enough about how this thing goes down, but I mean, it says that they've never conducted any missionary programs in Israel. We clearly instruct our peace pilgrims against such activity during their stay here because, um, uh, missionary activities are illegal right. in Israel. So yes, they no, are no freedom of speech there. I mean, um, it says, you know, a lot of Christians are there, Israeli lawmakers are there, government representatives are there, ordinary Israelis are there. Um, they Apparently they have some kind of big march. If you want to be a party animal, you have to learn to yeah. live in the jungle. Yeah, it seems, I, 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 Sukkoth, as I recall, is a, a, a um, kind of a, a harvest festival. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, no, so, no, it'd be a planting festival. Because they plant in the fall and harvest in the spring. 
kind of cost of the harvest festival. Are you incapable oh, okay. of restraining yourself, or do you take pride in no, being no. an insufferable know-it-all? But it's a, yeah, I mean, it's a sort of agricultural thing anyway. So Don't get technical with me. I mean, I... Okay, our... Are some Christians, if they're talking to Jews and, and, you know, might they end up getting in a discussion of their understanding of who Jesus is or something like that? Maybe. You know, you put a bunch of different minded people together. Are they going to talk about their differences? It's mm-hmm. entirely possible, you know. So, but, you know, at the same time, look at this and say, okay, um, how, how strong are your people? in their faith, how, how well do they know their teachings? You know, are the, do they, do they know enough about what they believe and why they believe it that it's not going to affect them if they go talk to Christians? You know, cause basically what he's saying is don't talk to Christians. They might right. convert you to Christianity. Yeah. I kind of like, uh, one guy says, you know, this has been going on for 27 years. What's the problem with it going on now? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. You know, I mean, uh, you, you haven't said anything about it, you know, this long. Why are you suddenly now hanging down this ruling that you can't go? It says, for many here, proselytizing is dangerously close to the forced conversions European Jews endured for centuries. <laughs> It doesn't say it's the same as for many there. And again, how somebody may interpret that is another question. So, But, wow. I mean, I, I guess if you're really looking for it, the, you know, it's kind of a stretch, though. Mm-hmm. So but, I don't and that's one ruling that the chief rabbinate has made. And the other one now that uh, has gotten a lot of people upset in Israel is that they found out there's a crematorium in Israel. And a lot of the, especially the ultra-Orthodox Jews, were just really upset to find out about this. Uh, because by Jewish law, the, 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 bear, the body is to be buried uh, within 24 hours, um, without and a shroud. Ritually cleansed. Yeah, ritually cleansed. Yeah, wrapped in shrouds without a coffin. And... Um, here, um, and the, and the state, by the way, if you if you want to have a religious funeral, the state of Israel pays for it. If it's a Jewish funeral, right? I mean, but yeah, if it's a religious Jewish fu- nice. fu- funeral, they, they 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 pay for it. Uh, you don't even have to go out and take out uh, you know insurance for it. Yeah, non-Jews are buried by their own clergy and in their own cemeteries. Um, but this is the first company to offer cremation, which is strictly forbidden um, in by Judaism. And uh, says his funeral home caters primarily to secular Israelis who prefer to bypass the religious authorities, even though it's expensive. Full burial with coffin and tombstone costs about four thousand dollars. That's insanely cheap compared to American funerals. Well, wow, although. I think if you take it in terms of how much money they make, it's probably quite well, a bit. Yeah, I suppose. Um, it says he charges about half that sum for a creation. Uh, cre- cremation. Sorry. Significant difference between those <laughs> I'm going to say. <laughs> it's amazing what uh, one letter will do. Anyway, so this guy, um, he's an ultra orthodox um, activist. Um, what is his name? Uh, fear of a name only increases fear of the thing itself. Uh, Hebra, no. Uh, uh, Yehuda Meshi Yehuda. Zahav. Yeah. Uh, head of Zaka, an ultra orthodox rescue service. Uh, best known for gathering body parts of victims of suicide bombings to ensure them a proper burial. Anyway, he was on the scene bef- the day before. Uh, of this crematorium, he was seen there. Um, the following day, uh, they published the location of it because it was hidden because they didn't want this to happen. And um, then afterwards, it burned down. And he said, "Yeah, he was there." He said, "Well, the structure was designed for burning. Now it has it's fulfilled its purpose." Yep. 
Yeah, boy, if, if there was ever anything close to an admission of guilt. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um. So, and well, it doesn't help, though, that uh, uh, Yitzhak Cohen, the Minister for Religious Affairs uh, from the ultra-Orthodox Shah's party, refused to condemn the fire. Instead, he pledged to outlaw the funeral home that continued the legacy of the destroyers of the Jewish people. In other words, um, well... Uh, somebody burned that one down. Well, nobody else better build one. <laughs> right. Um, In other words, yay. It's interesting, though, that the secular head of the left-wing merits party said, what? Yeah, they got enough rules on our life. They want to interfere with our death, too? Their extremism has no limits. Help! Help! I'm being repressed! Yeah, and, and of course, they compare this one to the Holocaust, too. Right. Because Jews were burned, and I mean, this one I thought I thought had a, a closer connection. If you if you're going to draw a connection with the Holocaust or, or something like that, um, but I mean, at the same time, these are it's not like this is being forced on anyone. Right. This is not only is it um, is it only offered to those who specifically request it. They have to kind of seek it out, right? Because up to this point, the location of it was hidden. I mean, it was advertised, but apparently you had to contact them and make arrangements before they would ever tell you where the place was. Or, I don't know, maybe they wouldn't even tell you where it was. They'd just have a pick-up and drop-off point or something. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the guy who, who runs us, Nativ, says, the Nazis buried far more Jews than they burned, so we're not going to bury people? He knows that several Jewish luminaries, including Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein, and Milton Friedman, had chosen cremation. I did not know that. So, I, you know, what I think what this really comes down to is Israel needs to figure out, are they a state-run church, or, uh, I'm sorry, a church-run state or not? Or a synagogue-run state. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, technically, yeah. Uh, the other thing that, that that's uh, 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 about... The other thing, though, I think was an interesting problem is that they're having trouble finding room to bury people. And they're stacking them up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. which is which was exactly the problem in Jesus' day. They didn't. They were running out of burial space, so they you rented the thing for fifty years basically, and then they took the remains and stuck them in the ossuaries, and you know, put the bone boxes that we've you know we've talked about a couple times. Right. Right. I mean. Yeah. I. Yeah, you're right. I think you got you actually got a good question there. Is this really a secular state, or is this a ultra-Orthodox Jewish state. Right. And, you, yeah, know, I, you know, they need to figure that out. They need to come to a decision and, and be honest about it and, and say, all right, well, you know what? You know, if, if that's the way you're going to run it, fine, but let's be honest about it and, and tell people, look, if you're not a, an Orthodox Jew, and then uh, you're you're not really welcome here. Or, or you know, you're welcome here, but... Uh, only if you follow our our rules. Right. If you're not an Orthodox Jew, you're going to live like one anyway. So which, I mean, talk about forced conversions. We're living in a dictatorship. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I guess I've, I've never understood forcing someone to act like they're a part of your religion if they're not. Because ultimately it's not about what they do, it's, it's about what they believe. So I've, you know, I've always been against forced conversion for that reason. You can't well, force anybody to believe something. Which is the one guy's co comment, you know, what they're going to bother us in death too. I mean, but apparently, I mean, they've got rules. They can, they got rules over marriage. They got rules over divorces. Uh, you know, the, this this ortho, ultra orthodox group, which, by the way, is not only a religious party, it's also a political party generally. I mean, uh, yeah, and you, you know. They have this multiplicity of parties in the parliament, and so they have to forge these alliances. And you got to get some of these extremist groups to join your alliance so you can elect a prime minister. Are you a God-fearing man, Senator? And then they, they kind of reward them by giving them all this religious power. So, yeah. but uh, Boy, that's a mess. I agree with you, and uh, but we live in a a, a you know we, we we live in a different country where it's you know much more which is officially secular. Right. Um, yeah. And I think it has its advantages. But hey, the, there was one thing in here. 
sure. that, that really caught my eye that I thought it was, it was sort of, it, it didn't really have much to do with the, the story, but it, it just caught my attention. It says that his company can also, this is talking about the guy that runs the crematorium, um, can also provide a traditional Jewish funeral as well as a burial at sea and can turn ashes into a diamond or even have them launched into outer space. Reach for the sky! Just, just a little bit creepy to, to think of turning a person's ashes into a diamond. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I just thought, you know, I'm uh, wearing mom around my neck or something. That's just, ugh. Sorry, uh, I just... It, that's a big you rock you got on that finger. Oh, really? Think so? That's my husband. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. My former husband. I that like gives, him. like holding me into the wedding ring. People used to tell me that I had him around my little finger. Now I do. <laughs> now I do. Oh, man. Oh, we're going downhill quick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's our last story, and that's probably for the best. Hey, kids, that's enough for one night, eh? Okay, maybe you thought that joke was really tacky. Um, <laughs> if you'd you, like to chastise Jim, <laughs> you can email us at podcast at crossfeednews.com or you can call our voicemail line at 206-350-4749. Or, or you, you can click on the screen, on the screen right now and, and say, what in the world did you just say? Because <laughs> yeah, I don't edit stuff like that out. <laughs> Everybody, hey, you know what? This is a real labor of love for for Dale and I. Nobody pays us for this. Um, so we would just thank you very much for listening. And uh, we also thank you very much um, for making us part of your day and part of your week. It means a lot to us. Please let yep. us know you're yep. out there. Yeah, yeah, we love hearing from you. Um, you know, even if it's negative stuff, negative, positive, whatever. We just, um, you know, it's, it's just nice to know that, that people appreciate it um, or or, or whatever that you know um we we also speaking of which we, we also want to thank our sponsors pdaperformance.com um they don't give us money either but they do provide our hosting and bandwidth which costs them money and uh and we really do appreciate that so um because that makes it possible we just wouldn't be able to afford to do this um if, if it weren't for them so we really appreciate them yeah, I think that's about it for tonight. Huh? Yes, it is. So God bless everybody, and we will see you next week. Oh, oh, oh. Um. Uh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was just thinking about my weekend and and stuff, and I should be able to get this one out on time. If it came out late, um, I'll apologize in advance, but I should be able to get this out sometime soon. So. Of course, they won't listen to your apology until after you get it out. Anyway. Great. On that note, apologizing in advance. Goodbye, everybody. Good night, everybody. God bless.